Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Tuesday night talk. My name is Elizabeth Padilla, and I will be facilitating this evening's talk on emotional detox. How is everyone? I should probably let you unmute yourselves. It's good to see you, Michelle and Fabi. And we have a nice gathering here this evening. This um, topic, emotional detox, is um, very dear to my heart. When this first title first came up, I thought, oh, I can't give a talk on this. I still have a lot of work to do. <laughs> but then I realized, oh no, I absolutely can talk on this topic. And it is an ongoing process. And I am so glad that I've been following a spiritual practice for as long as I have. I came in with a lot of baggage and I've been able to gracefully lighten my load along the way. So let's first look at, well, what is detox? Or what does that mean? And clinically for the body, it means to you've accumulated toxins in the system, right? Waste. So if we've had too much of something, too much sugar, too much salt, too much fat, um, whatever it may be, um, it will build up in the system and um, it can be actually dangerous for the system if there's blockage because of the waste. And so what do we do? We want to have a detox. And I don't know if any of you have ever done a physical detox where you might do some fasting. And what that does, fasting or um, uh, changing your diet, um, it allows the waste to slowly be eliminated from the body. And it takes time. And on the uh, emotionally also, it takes time. And so the first thing is to understand a few spiritual laws that I'd like to share with you. And also some uh, little tips that have helped me along the way. Um, you know, living in life, taking care of a family, being part of a family or part of a, a relationship and how to um, feel healthy and vibrant and free, creative um, and empowered. These are important, but in order to do that, I need to um, feel light um, to be in the flow. So a healthy system is a system that flows. Any doctor, any cardiologist, urologist, um, uh, neurologist, they will tell you if there's blockage, you will experience what? If there's blockage in your physical system, you will experience pain. If I have overload mentally, I will feel a headache. I will feel uh, mental congestion. I will feel confused. And when there's an emotional overload, it will be quite painful. And so our, our instinct is to go within. And um, I'm really happy that you joined tonight because I know your intuition or your gut feeling is that the answers are inside to be able to make peace with our emotions. Emotions are a good thing, just as food is a good thing, right? but we have to have a balanced diet. So 
I would say one of the main things that have helped me a lot is to understand our relationship to the past. Now, the past actually governs a lot of our thinking and our thoughts are what trigger our emotions. And we also understand on a conceptual level, the past is gone. The past doesn't exist. Yet why is it that 90% of my thinking and even associating new, even learning new things, I associate with the past? And we learn from the past, but we also carry heaviness from the past. And another thing is also our, percep our perception or our perspective, our vision on ourselves or how we relate to things that have happened to us. And this too will color my world, how I see things. For example, if you had a room of people, okay, let's say there was seven people in a room and in jumps in a big German shepherd, okay? Now, wouldn't you say each one would have a different response to the dog? And this could be people you know, and not everybody's a dog person, and some people are terrified of dogs. Now, the dog just come in, came in, it was wanted to know what was going on. The dog is innocent. So if some people say, oh, look at the puppy, and other people would go, oh my God, you know, who let this stinky thing in here? And another person would be absolutely terrified. I've seen this happen. They're actually frozen in fear. So is it the dog's fault for all those different reactions? The dog is innocent. But according to our past and how we see things, whatever events happen in our lives, we project our experiences on the present moment. And so this can also go with people. If you've ever been to a post office and you're waiting in long lines and um, you bring, you know, your mail and then the the post person or whoever's behind the desk says there's everything wrong with your mail. And they get all upset and they said, go do it right. And then you're upset. And then you're thinking, what a horrible person. <laughs> you're all upset. And then the friend that you're with that happened to be with you in the post office is quite charmed and sees this tired old person, you know, this poor guy, he's had a hard day and starts a conversation. This is something that happened to me actually. So you probably could tell. And I was the one that felt the victim by the situation that this mean guy behind the counter, but my friend could see that he was just having a hard day, a bad day. And when I saw her reaction to the situation, I followed her lead and I just erased that vision I had and I started to see him in that light. And then everything was perfect about our mail. It all went smoothly. Now, if I had kept on my vision and my friend wasn't with me and I, I kept with that, what kind of response would I had if I returned with my, my uh, corrected uh, issues of my mail? How would that uh, uh, person behind the desk treat me? You know, and I would have that vision of you mean person. It would be a different experience. So one thing that is really important is to not feel that I'm a victim. It's very, it's hard. So we'll look at that. We'll take a moment to look at that. Um, how I can change things is really um, dependent on being a master or empowered. 
I always have choice. No matter what the situation, I always have a choice. Another experience that I had, um, and this was maybe 10 years ago, and it was a family situation with property and money. And I was, um, you know, I had my share, right? But it didn't turn out the way that I thought it would. And so um, I was quite upset by the situation. Like, how could it be this way? And so I, I talked, uh, you know, to myself and I, I sat in meditation and I, I said, I could win in a court of law easily. But the thought was that if I did that, I would lose a family. And so then a new thought came and that new thought was, let go, bow. And, my, you know, that's totally not my usual method of operation. So I knew that it was coming from a, a, a higher frequency of thought. A pure frequency of thought, a reference of divine energy that I was able to tap into to get that, what I call a download of sensibility. And what brought me to my senses was this thought to bow. And I felt, an, I felt such relief and I let it go. And then it really improved my relationship with the family. And even though it, it appeared to be a loss, it was a gain because I found my happiness. I found my peace of mind. I was able to forgive and let go. And whatever karma someone else has, even if they cause you harm, if you understand the law of karma of any degree, what you put out comes back, right? So I can't really forgive the deeds of others, can I? Can I really relinquish the debt of another person, even if they harmed me? So the act of forgiveness is actually for whom? The act of forgiveness is actually to release myself. I free myself. The other person who might be causing harm, they will get the return of their karma. And not that I have that satisfaction. It's just the, how things work. But if I let it go and I have good wishes and good feelings, then instead of stuck energy, waste thoughts, waste emotions, I am in the flow. I let go. So those are just a couple experiences that I've had and how I could see um, I'm a more of an emotional dynamic actually and how I've made peace with my emotions and to identify those emotions that are toxic and actually those emotions that are healing and empowering. And I do know which ones those are. Love, peace, joy, well-being, and that sense of well-being that isn't derived from physical security. Yes, that's important too, but where just being is enough, that contentment and satisfaction with myself. And I'll talk more about that, but I'm going to show you a little PowerPoint I put together <clears throat> just for a few points, just to kind of make it clear. Let's see here. Let's start from the beginning. Oh, 
Okay. Oh, I see. Now, can you all see me? Could someone, I yes, can't. We okay. can. Yes, we can. Okay. Gosh, I want to see you all. I just stopped it for a minute. Okay. Well, how can I do that? I want to be able to see you all, but I can't. Oh, well. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So I already sort of introduced that part. And you do have to kind of ask yourself some of these questions, you know, what do you want more in your life? And I sort of baited you a little bit by offering that freedom and flow. And for each of us, that'll show up differently. Um, because we're unique and we all have different things that we're working on. And we all have different things that we excel in. Um, so at this juncture, at this chapter in my life, what do I want more of? And if I ask that really honestly, and, and the more I go from a value system that's based on spirituality, spiritual values, they'll be more long-term, the results will be long-term. And that's the love, the peace, the joy, the bliss, um, wisdom, innate wisdom. Um, and it can manifest in different ways. So even if I begin with something that I'm aspiring for, then you can identify that core value in, in that endeavor that you want in life, even if it's a job or maybe a creative aspiration or project um, or relationship. But to identify what the core value or core need is. And then what's keeping you from that? To ask yourself. And it could be even forgiving myself. Maybe there's something that I need to let go of to free myself, um, something in the way. And this is where journaling could come in handy. You know, I like to journal and, um, you know, just to have that conversation on paper. But then the meditation is a level of um, organizing your thoughts in such a way where you have a mental conversation with yourself and with a divine source, a divine frequency, um, and be that, you may call that God, you may call that um, a divine energy or higher consciousness, but it's really important to have some reference for divinity. And you will find stability in this um, frequency, this higher frequency. And so whatever is keeping me from that is also an indicator. And that's why I, I sort of mentioned, you know, is there something I need to forgive myself for, or to let go of something from the past, a pain, or to figure, forgive someone else? Um, or, um, in a relationships, this is well, this is where a lot of these issues show up is in our relationships. And we have these expectations. We come into these relationships hoping to fulfill um, you know, needs. And then people are people and they change. And we understand we can't change people. We understand that I can only change myself. Yet we still try to change the other. We still have this vision on an external level of wanting to, if only this person could be like this, or shouldn't I tell them that they need to be um, knowing the truth about themselves? <laughs> you know, 
but in actuality, um, my neighbor is my own self made visible. And I find that when I use my relationship or many relationships as a way or means to understand myself, to use them as a mirror. And um, it's not that I might have a defect similar to the one that might be upsetting me, but to that degree I'm upset, that much I could maybe investigate and see that actually is a hidden secret, a hidden treasure that if I can identify what that is, I will learn something and be able to let it go. So there are steps. So whatever is coming into my life is exactly what I need. It's happening for me. But in order to digest these ever flowing in, you know, situations, I have to have perspective. And so um, one of the tools for emotional detox, which is very important, is this principle of being detached. And spiritual detachment is not where you cut yourself off from others or from your responsibilities or from your duties. Uh, detachment is simply that ability to step down off of the stage of the drama, the stage of situations, and to sit into the theater, step down and sit back and just take a look at what that scene is, what's happening, why I might be finding it disturbing, or maybe I want to know what it is that I need to learn. Usually we, um, you know, it's the disturbances that sort of make us stop in our tracks, right? If we hit a brick wall, we stop in our tracks. If something's painful, you know, it, we, you know, either we want to blame, um, we want to thwart outwards, but that energy only creates more. Whatever I fight, I only strengthen. And whatever I resist, it accumulates, right? It persists, it follows me like a hungry dog. And whatever I oppose, whatever I go against, I actually take it on. I'll become that. Um, I've seen that in myself, you know, where, where I advocate against something and I have an advocate spine. So I've had um, these experiences where this isn't right. How could this happen? But then I would be taking on that anger and that angst. And so then I'd have to ask myself, what's the solution? What is it that I really need? I know this isn't just, this isn't right, but how can I be part of the solution? Being angry, being upset, passion can turn into compassion. And compassion is healthy. It gets us out of bed in the morning. But to focus that energy in such a way where I'm productive and proactive, where I'm not fighting something. But again, I have to stand back and be detached and see the big picture. And so I did say, like when I said trip ups here, it's really that difference. It's not running away not just it's not a relief um to just say i've had it i'm done i'm out of here um but if i really let go i'm still present so being detached means i'm present and if i'm loving it means i have that uh that divine connection or that divine reference i'm at that vibrational level of peace or contentment, of confidence, and it takes practice, a sense of self, and I'll detach from them means I get uninvested 
that I don't want to try to change the other, that you owe me an apology, or you, um, I deserve, I don't deserve this. If someone is under the influence of their past, of their thought process, of their emotions, it's like they're under a dis-ease. You know, if someone has, let's say, a physical stroke and they're, par they're paralyzed, would I waste my energy saying, get up, get up. How could you not be moving? I'm counting on you. You know, um, I, you need to play this role for me. How can you be, you know, um, paralyzed on one side of your body? And you can't, I can't understand what you're saying. You know, would I beat my head? No, I would have compassion. I would, I would have empathy. I would, um, you know, help. I would embrace. And so emo it's funny when it comes down to emotions, when we're confronted with someone's emotional paralysis, when they're in a stuck place and you hurt the ones you love because they're the ones closest to you. And so we will project our issues, our um, struggles, our um, issues, uh, you know, these, these, um, stories, these that we identify with, you know, but it takes a lot of spiritual strength to go beyond our story. And so to let it go, but with compassion and with love and being present, but instead of what you owe me, if I'm at that higher frequency, then the energy will be a flow of how can I help or what can I learn from this to release me from that emotional struggle, that emotional investment. You know, you're supposed to love me. You're supposed to appreciate me. And so then I get emotionally um, bound by people that are in a paralysis who who aren't able to give. And so I have to have that ability to stand back to understand where that one is coming from. I think one of the greatest releases for me is to develop this ability to listen, to take in the other. But that can't happen until I listen to myself. And of course, meditation is that um, ability to have that mental conversation with the self and a mental conversation or rapport with your divine reference, with a source of pure goodness, of stability, not based on physical gain or loss or higher or lower, or mine and yours. Something that's eternal, something that's on a continuum. It's not based on physical laws. These are spiritual laws. They're eternal. Spiritual laws are based on eternal energy. And physical laws are based on energy that's constantly changing. And so that's perhaps why we will have that instinct or, or intuition to go within when we're struggling with what's happening outside of us in the physical world. And so the first step is to understand that I'm a spiritual being, that I am a conscient energy, and that the soul is eternal and that I'm playing my role. I entered this physical world. I'm a traveler. I'm here on visiting and I'm in this physical body playing my part. And one day I will leave this world. I enter and exit. And so that's also that perspective of flow. I'm, I'm just visiting. I'm a traveler. And you know, when you visit, you have a different 
outlook when you're traveling? Have you ever seen people when they come to visit your own town or your own city where you live? And you see them look at the Golden Gate Bridge for the first time or um, Chinatown for the first time. And everything is wonderful and amazing. And you sort of live through their eyes as you show them around. And I call this vacation consciousness. And it's something, it's actually kind of a, a nice thing to practice just, just for fun. And just as children do, to see things for the first time. To see the other in a different light, as if you're seeing them for the first time. And also to kind of see yourself for the first time, to see myself in a different light, to see myself as someone that the divine cannot wait to have that loving rapport with, or to see myself as a pure, childlike, innocent energy that can't wait to create, or to see myself as this master, an experienced soul who's, who's perhaps learned a few things along the way that I can help others. But to create that flow, to loosen any of that waste, and to begin that detox, and it does take time, but you can have an um, immediate results by practicing this standing back, being the detached observer. So stop, observe, and steer. SOS, something to remember. SOS. Stop, observe, and then perform, steer. We always have a choice no matter what the situation is. I always have a choice. And I've, you know, you've heard amazing things from people like Nelson Mandela or, you know, people that have survived difficult situations, but they chose to stand back and look at the big picture and they were able to be motivators and, and people of in, in great um, integrity, inspiring. Um, but it, it wasn't that it was grueling for them. It was what they could see. So their emotions weren't in the way. They could see beyond themselves, beyond their story, or beyond the story that was in front of them and to see a new story and that we all are intrinsically good. Each and every soul is a loving, peaceful, joyful being, but we forgot ourselves. And it's again like this paralysis, this identity to form yeah, we're here for a reason, and that's to create, to experience, to express. But when I take on my creation as my identity, because whatever, right, whatever we create in this world doesn't last forever, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a project, um, uh, whether it's a you built a house, or uh, your car will break down, the house will break down, the relationship will change. Everything goes through these cycles. And when I'm identified, my happiness is identified or invested, my joy, my sense of uh, who I am in the physical realm of things, then I'm setting myself up for disappointment, for deception, for blockage, for heartache. But when I understand that everybody has their story, everybody has their perception, um, everyone is different. And when I understand these cycles and I understand karma, 
then I realize that karma actually comes to say goodbye. Whether it's good karma, mediocre karma, or negative karma, it doesn't stay forever, does it? And these are the fruits from past actions, but they always come to say goodbye. And if I, uh, whatever it is, good or bad, I have the choice to let it in, to resent, to fear. It only attracts it more, doesn't it? But if I choose to respect, meaning if I respect a difficult karma, then I learn from it and I move on. If I respect the joy, then I spread it. If I respect the love, then I give it and more. And that would be the law of abundance that will bring more abundance. So understanding the laws of the physical world with the laws of the spiritual dimensions, and I bring them together as a, um, you could say a yogi in life. I mean, it sounds romantic, I know, but, but um, or just um, a spiritual scientist, whatever term works. But this image of yourself as this spiritual presence in this physical body playing my, my role. Um, and so by practicing the meditation every day, whenever you get a chance, being the detached observer and also resonating in that higher frequency. So let's look at how our thoughts work here because our emotions are tied in with our thoughts and our emotions will color how I see things. We process umpteen thoughts in a day. Some say 60,000 thoughts in a day, but the thoughts fuel our lives and we're rarely aware of our thoughts. If, if you notice that some days when you're driving, everything's hunky-dory, no problem. You let people come in front of you, you know, <laughs> no problem. Um, uh, and then there's other days you're, you're in traffic and you're, you know, same traffic you're in the day before where everything was just fine and you let cars in. But why is it the next day you will get upset. Don't you dare think of getting in front of me, you know? And we'll just have these, you know, different um, kind of, either we have a day with a cloud over our head or a day of sunshine. And um, it's really based on our thoughts. And we, it's hard because we create that trajectory from the moment we wake up in the morning, our disposition is set. Even though we have this automatic response to our day, if we have a, a kind of a routine in the morning, you know, brushing our teeth, uh, putting toast in the toaster, whatever that is, <clears throat> um, starting the hot water for some coffee or tea, then getting into the car and going to work, or, or now we're at home, most of us doing our work, but do you ever stop to think, you know, how did I get there to my destination? How did I arrive back home? Or how did I go through the day? How much, you know, you get to the other end of your day and it's like, was I even present? Where did my day go? So we really aren't aware. And so awareness is so key. To be aware in every moment is the life of a meditator or a yogi um, or a spiritual person. And it's interesting because that's where the soul gets rest. That's where our emotions are met with when we are aware. We come to a place of stability.
when we're aware. Of course, when our day goes from us and we get caught and um, we might be struggling, but a lot of our thoughts, like if I'm having a bad day and we have a test that comes, I'll probably fail that test if someone, um, like, like the postman, if I was having a bad day and he reacts, then I might say something that I would regret. And then that relationship is out the window. But if I'm having a good day or where I'm at peace with myself and I'm, you know, I understand exercising choice, I cannot exercise choice without awareness. Impossible. And awareness comes when I can have that ability to detach. And this is like a muscle. Our reasoning, even our intuition, our, our, our intellect or conscience, it's this one and the same. Our gut feelings, it's like a muscle. And we have to do these reps every day to strengthen that muscle. And so our emotions will run away with us. Our thoughts will run away with us. It will take us off the track. Have you ever walked a dog and it's caught a scent? And if it's not on a leash, it'll go off. <laughs> you know, <laughs> It's caught a scent and it's gone. And that's kind of how it is with our thinking. Um, and you call it, come back. Oh, gosh. And so our thoughts are like that, or our mind can do that. It goes off on these trails. And perhaps that's why in the morning it's so good to have quiet time with yourself to kind of create a different trajectory of choice for your day, a mindset, a, a goal for that day. Um, and then that will be my outlook. So my thoughts color my perceptions, my perceptions create how I see things, my vision, and of course, my attitude will color how I perform. And so if I'm grumpy or if I'm contented, happy, the same ordinary action will become extraordinary or a means for creating sorrow. And then it'll leave that impression. And then, of course, it'll feed my thoughts. And this is why the past has such a good influence, because it leaves these imprints, these memories on us. And so in order to create change, if I have, these are cycles, this is the pattern of our thinking. And in order to change a negative cycle into a positive, what do I have to do? How do I change a vicious cycle into a positive? I need that muscle of my conscience, of my reasoning, of my intuition, of my practice. And to begin to create new thoughts and to understand that whatever's happening is happening for me. To trust life and the rhythm of life to trust myself, to trust uh, relationships, and, you know, to understand them, to listen and to learn, doesn't mean that I uh, get over-invested or dependent, you know, but that it's respectful a respectful and in my own self-respect and respecting the other and also having that relationship with the divine. So this also empowers me in creating choice. And I think this speaks for itself. I mean, uh, they say love moves mountains um, and it shouldn't be, I mean, if you're in the flow, that unconditional love, it's interesting. They talk about unconditional love. It, that means it's not invested where you have an expectation. It's not an easy 
It's not easy, but boy, is it sweet. We understand it. And um, in our relationships, and if you have like a family unit, I'll just kind of stop for a moment. Um, you know, when you're in a family kind of situation, you know, that's where we, we show up our, our thought processes and how we see ourselves in our, in the ones we love and in our relationships. And maybe you've raised a couple kids now and you get really invested and then that honeymoon phase kind of goes in anything, even your relationship to your job. Um, but I'm just saying with like a family unit. And um, if, if one of them in your family gets depressed, and this, I just wanted to bring this up because it's, it's very common. I think one in four suffer from depression. So in a family of four, somebody will probably have a challenge. And this is where sometimes we'll want to be the savior and we'll go after them. But what happens is I will go into the sinkhole, you know, and trap myself in that same, right, negative thought pattern of depression. You know, wanting, why aren't you wanting to get them out of that depressed state? You should be like this. And why aren't you doing this? Or, or you want to feel their pain for them and their sorrow for them. And then the kids will follow suit or the kids will, you know, rebel. And then there's like this fighting and tug of war that'll happen in relationships because you're not fulfilling your duty. And um, because you are having a paralysis, an emotional paralysis, and that's what I call depression. You're paralyzed. You can't function. You're not at your normal creative um, influence in the world. When there's flow, there's creativity. When there's flow, there's love, there's peace of mind, there's happiness. When there's stuckness and waste, then there's sorrow. And then it can, you know, it'll acerbate and and grow and become depression. And so we'll go after the one or we'll try to change them and then they'll be fighting and then I get stuck. So it shouldn't be that I take on the disease. I take on that paralysis that I, I so I need to remain, huh? I have to be happy. I have to be joyful, not in spite of or to put down but it shouldn't be that I match that energy. And because I have the rest of the family, you know, to, to keep up. And so I come from a big family, so I'm coming from a specific experience. And um, I'm one of seven kids, I'm the eldest, and there's one of them that was spinning their wheels. And then we play savior, and then they're spinning their wheels. <laughs> and, um, and then the parents get all upset. And then they feel um, that, what did I do wrong? And so then it becomes this big. And so we think that the only way to do it is that we all want to fix this one person. But instead of helping them, what happens? I will take on their dis-ease or their uh, heaviness. And so instead of helping them, then the whole family gets trapped or invested. So I need to allow them through their process. And if I take on the disease, how can I help them? So this is where detachment comes in, but that I am a loving conduit 
Because what happens, I think what happens really when I get invested in a relationship is that I'm expecting them to be different than what they are. And they have to, you know, find their way. And, um, you know, and now all the, the, my siblings are all grown up and, and they're, um, you know, they've made their choices in life. And so we, I just wouldn't buy the gossip. And so this is where I'm going. The gossip, nothing is worse in creating emotional toxicity than gossip and talking about others and about their disease um, and their, um, you know, that they're doing this wrong and that wrong and why can't they and they should do this and that. But instead that I should let it go, have that forgiveness, allow them to be who they are. They're battling through their own process, through their own demons, I send them good wishes and pure feelings. I invest in their talents and their skills. I greet them with love and regard. I see them in that light that they will be healthy. And it's their choice. And I just continue with that good wishes, positive feelings, and I, I remember my dad going, you won't believe now what's happening. And I go, dad, I dad, you know, I said, I can't go there. And I was kind of strict with him and he got it because he, he knows me. He got it. I said, dad, I can only invest in the good for this person. And interesting when I came, went la this last time, the family dynamics totally changed. And I don't, I'm not going to credit it to myself, but at least I'd like to think that I had something to do with it in just investing in um, the goodness. And I would go, make sure I would talk to that one. I would make sure I would listen to that one. I wouldn't take on. And if they started saying anything negative, I would just have this, I would just go within. And so they could pick up that I wasn't interested in that kind of conversation. And then I would try and make it a constructive conversation. So it's not that I would, you know, relieve myself by, you know, cutting them off and, and um, going in another room or, you know, thinking that I'm better than them. I'm going to not talk to you then. No, that doesn't work. Um, but seeing the good in everyone, even the ones that are struggling to help but don't know how to help, but investing in, in the goodness in everyone there um, and in the other and allowing them to struggle, allowing them, you know, to make it through. But if I get pulled down with them, I can't help them. I can't help them. Um, so, you know, to respect myself. Um, Okay, good. We have a little time. So I'll just finish. I think I have one more slide. Is that all right? How are we doing? Any questions? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> you can tell I really um, love this, this topic and making peace with emotions. And in such a way that to, even if something is upsetting, to say, okay, thank you. You've come to teach me something. And um, it could be my own upset. It could be the upset of someone else. Um, but to welcome it as a teacher. And once I identify what it is that I'm to learn, it's interesting. And you probably know this for yourselves, right? It dissipates. It's no longer an issue. It's like gone. It's kind of like magic. It doesn't have that pull. I don't react. And as soon as you're not reacting to that other person anymore and you see them in that new light, it's amazing. Um, I had a boss once many, many years ago. He was a bear. I mean, a real bear. And he, he would, he, I was, uh, the, worked in the office. He, everything you did was wrong. And 
everyone was intimidated by him. He had this big booming voice. And I said, you know what? I can't change this person, but I can change myself. I think I was 30 years old. So, um, so I would still get intimidated, you know, by these archetypes, these big, you know, boss. But I said, nope, this is good for me. Uh, this is some I'm learn. Um, this is something I'm going to learn here, and I was determined to not be influenced by his um, personality or uh, how he would react to things. So I didn't want to react. So I would always see his good qualities and invest in those good qualities and notice how he would be with other people or when if he giggled or laughed with others. I would start to see the teddy bear in the bear. And so then I wouldn't react. I guess I didn't analyze it. It wasn't like I was trying to measure e each and every moment. I just found that I wouldn't tense up in his company. I was relaxed. And after about a year, it took a year, he called me in his office. I thought, uh-oh, you know. But um, we started chatting. It was the end of the day. And he, he, we just started chatting. And before you know it, I was sitting on the chair neck across from him. And then he stopped for a moment, right? Like, wait a minute, this isn't in the script. <laughs> and he just said, you know, Elizabeth, I've never met anyone like you. And I, I you know, I, I didn't wanna, I just went, well, whatever, okay. <laughs> you know? But from then on, our relationship changed. It just shifted. And it feels like magic. But all I did was see the good in him. That's it. And invested. I didn't try to prove him wrong. Didn't try to change him. I didn't say, look, look now look what you've done. You got this um, client really upset. <laughs> you know, <laughs> see, see, you're a meanie. I want to prove that you're a meanie, right? But no, I wanted to prove to myself that he has a soft spot. And perhaps... He feels vulnerable and that's why he comes across like a bear. You know, I didn't get into the psychology. I just wanted to free myself. That's really what it comes down to. Okay. So nothing greater healer, healer than, than love. Okay, come on. Please. Oh, you're not going to help. Oh, so you're not going to help me, huh? <laughs> I'm trying to. Can you see this PowerPoint? I think you can. It's not. Yes, we see healing power of love. Okay. Hmm. Okay, let me try again. Thank you. Okay, so here, uh, some of these I've already covered, but we'll just go through this lovely list of things that'll help us. And the, of course, think of this as from a spiritual mindset and, um, and it's just to begin that clearing and it takes time. Any um, regiment you do for yourself, even for a, a physical detox, you have patience and just enjoy the ride. And there will be lovely moments and feedback that you're on the right track. And so we talked about being the observer and detached, and sometimes they call this mindfulness. Um, and then you'll get your insights and the, this is where the learning comes in uh you know and instead of having these filters and perceptions where um they're clogged or colored by you know past events that were um filled with you know resentment or ill feelings, 
negativity, um, and and a lot of them come from self doubt and um, shame is a big issue. Um, if you really, uh, oh gosh, shame is so toxic, um, but it's something that we live with. And there are, you know, we do need to have, there are positive, positive aspects about shame to know, to be able to have a conscience, to navigate through life, to know where the limits are. But when it repeats and it's uh, really when we're being hard on ourselves or hard on someone else, it can be toxic, really toxic. And it affects everyone in your family unit or in the relationship or in your workspace. And you'll see it. It's good to identify it. But it's real tricky because um, you can't shame others for their shame. <laughs> you will just get a double negative. And um, it part of undermining it is to identify it and um, to have that self-respect and that I deserve, I am worthy of love and belonging and others are also, everyone is worthy of love and belonging. I'm just kind of saying in a situation of a relationship. But the main thing is that I feel that for myself um, in every situation. Just really acceptance of the self, to not doubt the self. I would say when we have that peaceful relationship with ourselves and that self-acceptance, we will attract opportunities. And even the opportunities that come to us daily, we will be able to um, respond to them. I'll be able to catch the ball, you know, Opportunities come every day, but can I catch them? Am I able to, or do I freeze up? But to uh, really um, identify shame and, um, and I just call, and it's a strong word, I know, but I just thought I would bring it up since we're talking about toxicity, you know, and to detox, this is something um, worth mentioning. And it also leads us to victimhood. Um, and this makes us stuck. Um, I've often heard this game of um, victim looking for a savior, and it just creates this sort of gridlock in relationships. Um, and then you have, you want to say the other is the demonizer or the perpetrator. And then you need a judge and jury. And so this sort of, we live with this sort of system, this punitive kind of system, um, good and bad and um, victim and perpetrator and judge and jury, and then the savior. Um, so to identify those, but main thing is to not, I'm, I always have a choice. No one can deceive me unless I let them. We will get indicators. They will be, oh, yes, I thought so. You know, we'll get these little touchings. But if I'm not awake, if I'm not aware, if I'm not practicing mindfulness or meditation, then I'll just go on automatic. And then what dictates my responses will be what I've always done. But if I want to change these patterns, I have to be awake. I have to be in my hands on the driver. The, I, my, I'm seated in the driver's seat. My hands are on the wheel, foot on the gas, and I'm in control. But if I'm going on my old patterns, then I'm simply driving under the influence. 
And when I go into victim, no matter what situation, um, I'm basically, you know, doing that and I, I will be trapped. Um, and being curious is just fabulous. To me, this is the child, the inner child. And I, I mentioned this about, you know, being the visitor. I'm just visiting, right? And seeing things for the first time. And to be curious, you know, what makes someone tick or not to do psychoanalysis, but to go, well, really listen to the other person. What do you, what do you need or what, what is it that you aspire in life? You know, really to practice this ability to take in the other, to be curious, um, even for yourself, you know, what new skill can I learn? Um, what new thing can I do? Um, maybe change my vocation, maybe take up a language, whatever. Um, but, um, you know, whatever happens that I learn from them. Um, and of course, we talked about the identity, to shed the masks. Um, you know, we will play many roles in a day. You know, I'll talk to my dog a certain way, right? <laughs> to my pets in a certain way. Um, and I'll talk to my boss in a different way, um, to my clients in a different way, or my colleagues in a different way, to my friends. So we have many roles that we play but to not get stuck, to get so identified with them. Um, so if I play the parent and my child should behave in a certain way and they're not, then I'm, I will create a block. And if there is behavior that is not acceptable, then I need to stop and, and see them as a soul, to see them in a spiritual aspect that they're on their journey and to perhaps sit down with them and say, hey, you know, let's have a, a, a talk, you know, and to learn from them, to have that respect in that relationship rather than this is my role, you need to be obedient and you're disobedient and I won't have any other way. You better shape up or ship out, right? So yes, we play roles and we respect them, but that I'm not so invested in them that I can't listen and learn from the situation. Um, and of course, love and forgiveness. And what is my, just to mention in this, the safety guard in this, you know, from expectation is that I have that divine connection, that I have a reference of a high frequency of vibration where I really, in my meditation, just experience myself in that presence of divine, pure energy and just soak up the rays and soak up that vibration and really fill the soul with what it needs so that when I go into the arena, when I go onto the stage, that I can perform well and, and learn and listen and be agile so that I can be the observer in one moment and then perform the next moment. Any good actor knows to be able to be the observer whilst also engaging and performing. Um, otherwise, I'll take the role home with me. And if I do that, then they would call that instability, right? <laughs> if I go home thinking I'm still the character I'm playing, no, I have to be able to, okay, play my role, take off the mask, but I'm not identified with it. To be a really good actor, to be agile, um, and then of course, oh gosh, gratitude is a really a heart warmer. It really gets things flowing. Um, we have so much, and I know you know this, but even I forget, 
when I find myself maybe feeling sorry for myself or I, I've off my guard, you know, those moments, those vulnerable moments. And then I just stop and I go, wait a minute, you know, and even thank, I'll even sometimes thank the situation that this is an opportunity for me that may be difficult, but wow, you know, when we're going through it, it's hard. When we look back, we can appreciate that. Oh, wow. If that didn't happen, I wouldn't be where I am today. Right. You can look back at situations that were difficult and maybe now you can even laugh at them at things that happened in your childhood or even yesterday. But when you're going through them because of the mindset, because of the identity to that form or to that, whatever you're creating or to that job or that role and expectation of the other, we get invested and it's excruciating because of the stuck energy. So being the master is embracing the child. And so that inner sense is our innocence. To invest in that pure state of being that's inside us. Um, and then to marry that or embrace the wisdom of experience, you know, that voice of wisdom in us. And you could say heart and head, master and child. Um, but this is a sign of health and flow. So, any any comments? I'd love insights from you all. Or good to see you, Michael. I'm so glad you're in the class. And and Shashikant, glad to see you. And I see Mercedes and uh, Diego. <laughs> So um, any thoughts or questions? I'm assuming that you have your own wealth of experience. I'd love to hear from you. Um, also, any, any, anything was inspired in you or triggered that perhaps you could share? I loved what you said about, and I was just wondering if you had that, you know, an artistic background or acting background, because I love what you say about the agility that really resonated, the agility of going from, from observing to, to acting or to interacting and, and how we have, we have to do that all day long in a way it requires so much vigilance and awareness and Thanks. so much internal a reference right you know what is the reference for your identity and all of those roles if you can talk more about that um well coincidentally yes i i was trained at the american conservatory theater um i was very young when i got into theater um but it wasn't enough and so I wanted to be good at being myself, not good at being other people. <laughs> at least that's my, I think acting, you can be a very spiritual and be an actor. But for me, I knew what I needed to do. And um, so I let that go. And um, I'm, but it brought, it was a good, wonderful lesson for me um, of, of being an agile actor and playing the role, but not taking it home with me, not taking it on to let it go. And then it helps you to be spontaneous with those that you're performing with. And of course, I'm using this as a metaphor for life. So to really take in the other and have creativity happen in that moment, like maybe something new could happen. Because after a while, even in your relationships, it's like, it's as if we've been rehearsing this and we're just doing the same 
you know, it's the same old thing every day, right? Um, and, but when I bring curiosity and that ability to kind of take in and listen and learn, and first of all, with myself, and to kind of rediscover myself. Um, sometimes we want to change and so we want to let go. That relationship isn't fulfilling me because really it's that I haven't had that good relationship with myself. And I think those of us that are seasoned can agree, you know, um, you know, we, we try to fulfill ourselves through the other. And um, we, we are so dependent on their vision of ourselves rather than developing that vision for myself of how I see myself and my innate beauty, my potential. Um, and, and, and that is with my shortcomings. You know, a mother would love their child or a father, a parent would love their child in spite of their shortcomings. They, but they would invest in their potential. Mm -hmm. And to have that same outlook with myself. Um, and that's what, what will help me. That relationship with the self will help me in not getting over-invested in the roles that I play. And then thirdly, developing that rapport with the director. Uh, if I'm going to go on this metaphor, um, and that's a divine reference, you know, all the world's a stage and we are merely players. And that helps me to keep my perspective that, wait a minute, there's somebody out there that's got my back. I just have to be tuned in. So not only do I have to be mindful and vigilant in the moment, but also what it's not that it's I'm adding another, you know, muscle here. It's really this is what's going to give me muscle is that rapport with that. That divine connection. Um, I think what throws me for a loop sometimes is those punches in life that kind of throw me off my guard. And then you kind of go, well, gosh, you know, you, you feel disheartened. Disheartenment is really not a good place. But when I know that I'm I'm loved and I'm cherished, um, and I have that connection with that, I keep saying divine reference, that supreme being, whatever you want to call God, whatever that is, universal consciousness, but it's a high frequency. It's not affected by this realm of change, cause and effect. But I've heard scientists, some new age scientists, Lipton, Raiden, these, they're really onto it that consciousness is actually the, the foundation of all science. Mm. That, our, that our state of awareness alters our experiments, alters the vibration of the planet, alters our lives we can create a vortex simply by our type of awareness that we have if it's negative that's what i attract if it's positive right i'm not saying anything new so i think you said a great word romina of the vigilance and it's it is this keeping the flame lit but that's all that I need to do, really. Um, and spiritual wisdom helps. That fuels, keeps that lamp going, that oil lamp going. Um, and it and it'll resonate with the wisdom that's already there. Um, and it just helps awaken. So even this gathering here, all of us, I wish I can't wait till we can meet again, face to face. I love it when we share and um, then that wisdom comes alive in the room. And actually it is even now, even in this uh, setup with the Zoom world, I'm always amazed what, what 
what wonderful um, synchronicity uh, vibration that we create even in this um, little boxes on a screen um, because our intellects were were engaged and it your questions also bring it alive so that's why I love to hear from you um, uh, maybe um, Michael, you have anything you want to say? Oh, unmute yourself. Um. I tuned in part way to what you said, but when you were talking about the behavior of someone else and how that impacts me, mm -hmm. instead of thinking about where they're coming from, that's mm -hmm. their world. I don't control that. First, they need to attend to how I'm looking at it, quoting Shakespeare again, nothing in life is good or bad, but my thinking makes it so. That is, my discomfort isn't based on what they've done, but it create, comes from the thoughts in my head about how I'm looking at what they've done. And there is oftentimes some discomfort in me. They don't like me, I'm rejected or whatever it would be. And instead of looking at them, I might, to avoid my discomfort and looking at myself, it's much easier to look at them and what they're doing. So first I wanna to try to take a look at myself uh, and then look at them. The other thing, cause I only heard parts of what you said. The other thing you said something about not feeling their pain, okay? Think what you wanna do is not feel their pain. I wanna understand their discomfort. If I feel their pain, that means I'm in pain because I'm feeling their pain. That exists in my mind, not in their behavior. That means my behavior with them reflects pain instead of what you're talking about, the vibration of getting in touch with the kindness in myself. And um, people just want to feel that someone understands them because then they feel it's okay to be who they are. Just some thoughts. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Uh, and um, I see Ryan and Sangamitra. Hello. Yeah. Hello, yeah. Kat. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a question. Uh, yes, Kathy, hi. Yes, hi. Um, so you, when you were talking uh, a lot about energy and flow, um, do you think of energy as actually a, a physical vibration? Since, uh, well, it, <laughs> body. It, do I see it as a do I see it as a physical energy, a vibration, or how what you know, energy can be just a a word that doesn't involve anything physical, but I'm wondering if you think of it as physical, since we embody our emotions in other words do you see energy as a vibration or or what well energy is the flow whether it's physical or spiritual um and what some of the luminaries are saying is that uh uh, consciousness affects the physical and consciousness is derived from the spiritual and what I love about this this is the place where they intersect when consciousness affects the physical dimension now our thinking can give off a vibration and our emotions, of course, can give off a vibration and it'll affect the room. Have you heard the saying that you could cut the room with a knife? Like you, you could sense, oh my gosh, what just happened here, right? It's really palpable. Or you walk in and you go, gosh, I feel so at home here. I, I, I feel so peaceful here. People pick up even what's 
still radiating. Um, so I would say that yes to both. It'll, mm -hmm. It's coming from a spiritual place, but it manifests, it's known once it comes into the physical and, and effect. So we're here to create, we're here to affect our environment and, and to give. Um, and I think what gets, where we get stuck or I get stuck is when I have that expectation that, that the spiritual sustenance of love, bliss, purity, peace, joy, wisdom, that I, it, that I try to, you know, squeeze it out of the physical, um, aspects when really it's something that I already am if I allow it to be, but I need a jump start and to connect to that again, to that constant flow of that supreme energy, that fine energy, then I'm able to, to revitalize or recharge myself. And, um, and then it'll flow and affect, I create a vortex around, I, it just, I will draw it towards me things will shift and if enough people do this enough people are tuned in then we have a critical mass that will affect on a, a big way and that's the aim um, of the spiritual life of the of what i do of, and of the brahma kumaris um I muted you, Kathy, because there was some feedback, but please unmute if you had anything else to say. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything that you said, but I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on, I know that, I don't know, maybe it sounds crazy, what, like, what was vibrating um, to affect the physical well, yeah, yeah that would be the uh, well, how is your mind? The soul? Is, what is your mind? Well, the soul is alive, it's eternal. And it's it and um based on how it identifies itself, so will it be the quality of the thought and then the emotion and then the attitudes and then the the uh impressions or the karmic return. Um, I think one, I mean, around us, the physical world is, is alive and it's, it's vibrating, but I, I, you know, this is something very interesting. Light, light is vibration, color, mm -hmm. musical notes. These are vibrations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is this what we're talking about, Kathy? I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's a good question. No, I mean, it's something that I experience for myself. Um, I, you know, I, I feel like I've lived what you're saying in terms of our thoughts creating um, what's happening around us for sure. Uh, but I, I just wondered, you know, when you were using that word energy. Um, yeah, I just wondered. Yeah, all around us is energy. Is <laughs> and then there's there's conscient energy, you know, the, you know, and, and it is, I mean, I love music. I am just so fond of music and, and certain scales will create a vibration, a certain type of vibration that's conducive for certain feelings and other scales are conducive for other types and create moods and modes. Um, so thanks for bringing that up, uh, Michelle. And, and, uh, nature is very calming and, you know, nature is doing its thing, but it can also be violent, you know, cause it's morphing and changing. Um, but we're surrounded by, um, energy. And I think maybe what I like about your, your question, Kathy, is it makes me think that, well, conscient energy has choice. And so I, I can be instrumental in creating a vibration that is creative and influential 
and um, or I can choose to be, you know, I can choose not to. Um, and that um, that's kind of um, exciting to me. Um, you know, it's an invitation to be part of something, you know, and we co-create together through vibration. I know sometimes I've experienced, it feels like I'm Schrodinger's cat, depending, <laughs> depending on what's going on in the room. I feel like people are shooting around their, their vibrations and it kind of, it affects me. And sometimes I'm going to end up being like, oh, either mm -hmm. happy or sad or angry, depending on what the other person is experiencing. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, thank you. Shashikant, anything? Uh, yes, uh, I relate what Michelle said, musical notes. When any performing art or any art is pa his painting, that is spirituality, but it transforms into physical picture displayed to other people. So this is what I feel that spirituality get uh, manifested into physical form. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, beyond meditation, beyond yoga, that artist himself is involved in spiritually into that product. It product for us, but it is his creation, spirituality, spirituality. Beautiful. We are the, we are the observer. We say it is a beautiful picture, or it has intellect and uh, many adjectives we put. But mm -hmm. what feelings he has made is totally in it, within it, and that I feel it is spirituality. It is beyond any science or any. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. This is what. Thank you, Michelle. So yeah. Michelle. That musical note struck to me with the artist's creation. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I think, uh, thank you, Shashikant. And I think, uh, Sangamitra, you were going to say something. And Ryan. Thank you, Om Shanti. Yeah, I really loved how you, uh, how you uh, connected awareness into detach with detachment. Like uh, when we are aware that what is or what our state of mind is not the outside world but how it, how we are behaving then i think we will be able to detach ourselves from outside so for that we need to practice spirituality and when we clear our mind and our intellect then only we can give that good vibration even we can give a good vibration to the the plant that's in our house right like sometimes it uh, happens like if I'm uh, if the house environment is not good, then the plants are also not growing properly. But <laughs> on the other side, if we talk to a nature, if we are in a good state of mind, then we'll be able to see our environment is also growing with us. Mm -hmm. So and that's an example of uh, spreading our vibration unknowingly. And also picking up that type of vibration too. Yes. <laughs> Lovely. Diego, anything? Uh, it's, it was a very lovely talk. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's, it's really uh, practical, all the things that you talk about and full of experience. I think uh, I really appreciate your time, your journey about all your experiences putting in this talk. It was for me like amazing, amazing talk. Uh, hopefully you can continue with another soon. This kind of, of, of topics are very interesting for me. Thank you very much. Yeah, we have every Tuesday and next Tuesday, I'll segue uh, Diego to uh, uh, Vinod will be giving a talk uh, on intuition. 
Okay. So, uh, Dr. Vinod Mungopara, so he will talk about intuition next Tuesday. So Thank I invite you. Thank you, everyone. Should we just have a nice little meditation to close? Yes. Sound good? So I'll just say a few words to kind of guide us. But enjoy the stillness. Enjoy being aware of the flow of energy emanating from I, the soul, I am a loving presence. I always was and always will be a loving presence a pure being of light and I accept each moment the situations I accept myself and I tune in to that divine vibration of the Supreme Being like a warm embrace recharging the soul And then easily I return to the awareness of the room. Bringing that vibration of peace into the room. Through the body. and out into the atmosphere. Be peace, be in peace. Om Shanti. Om Shanti.